This is episode 35, a solo episode with me, Tiffany Hinton, and we're talking about biodynamic gardening for the fall on Cultivating Guts. Hello, it's Tiffany, and welcome back to Cultivating Guts, a podcast where we discuss gardening, homesteading, gut health, and following our intuition. I am super excited to be back with you guys. We've had so many fun moments on the homestead and ideas about really important topics. We've got our brand new monthly nature school, the Little Witches Moon Gardening Club, starting here in a few short, almost like two weeks. Oh my gosh, so much fun stuff happening. And today on the podcast, we're talking about biodynamic gardening for the fall. What are my three tips? What are things that you just can do to help your soil heal and just get more nutrients? How do you self-seed? and so many more topics today. If you're watching this on Spotify or YouTube, hello, hello, we are simultaneously video recording as we are also chatting today on the podcast. And if you wanna catch it on YouTube, go to youtube.com forward slash Tiffany Hinton to tune in. And once again, if you're listening to the podcast, we're also on iTunes and Spotify. So if you've got a few extra options there as well, if you wanna share it with your friends and an easy way to do that. So recently, I have been really thinking about what am I going to do this fall. Last week was autumn equinox. This week, we've had two light frosts. Next week, we're supposed to have a super hard frost. And so what does that mean on the homestead? It means I got some stuff to take care of. (laughs) I got some plants if I'm going to propagate, need to be clipped and Re roots regrown and get reseeded. I've got some stuff that needs to come inside of the greenhouse. I've got tomatoes that need to be harvested, squash that needs to be done, carrots to be dug up, potatoes to be dug up. It's like it's full harvest season for sure this weekend, and I'm super grateful that it's going to be in the high 60s. So some good long sleeve sweatshirts and some overalls and some boots, and we'll be off and running in the garden. So we're going to talk a lot about that on the podcast today and tips and tricks for you at home to continue to nourish your soil and ways to continue to do biodynamic gardening through the fall and winter. But before we get started, I want to ask you for a big favor. If you could subscribe, rate, and review the Cultivating Guts podcast and send me a screenshot of your review at tiffany at gfmomcertified.com, I will send you our four-day Hacking Your Health Gut Detox plan. Also, if you're listening, screenshot your favorite part of the podcast, share it on Instagram. I will repost it. Love sharing stuff, and you might even get a follow out of me. Uh, It's super fun just to see the podcast grow. We're into episode 35. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. And I also want to say I'm so grateful for you and all of our amazing listeners for helping us grow the podcast over the last year and sharing it with so many more people. Before we head into the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Today's podcast is sponsored by Non-Disclosure Apparel, and it is my go-to everyday bra like we've been talking about on the podcast. Super excited when I met Becky a little over a year ago and found their brand new Ellie Bralettes. Actually, I'm wearing one today. Uh, Not only because it has nipple coverage, but also because it has no wiring. It is super, super comfortable. It's not compressing like a sports bra would be. And I can wear it under t-shirts, no issues, no nipples. And people that are listening to the podcast are probably like, what, Tiffany? Honestly, yeah, my girls wear them. Um, Our photographer now has one and it is becoming this thing. And so if you do not yet have yourself an Ellie Bralette, not only is it a female-owned company designed and made in the USA, right here in the U.S., uh, it is a company that, and and if you go back to one of our earlier podcasts, you're going to hear Becky, but it is, Becky designed this company for her own need and to benefit other women and other little girls who were having embarrassing moments because their nipples were showing through their t-shirts or showing through their dresses. So definitely, I am super excited to have Non-Disclosure Apparel as a podcast sponsor for my own reasons, but also so we can help more young girls and women and just people that are, maybe you're doing yoga, you're doing farm chores, you're doing whatever, you're working from home. It's your everyday go-to bra. And we have a very special discount for our community only. And that code is GFMOM15. That saves you 15% off your total purchase. And then if you order two Ellie Bralettes, you will also receive free shipping. So we'll put all those details in the show notes, but definitely check out the Ellie Bralette by now. Welcome back to Cultivating Guts. It is so good to see you if you are live and to talk with you and talk to you today on the podcast. And it's definitely feeling like fall. I am recording this 
a little bit before it'll come out, but there is no buts, right, in life. Uh, so I just got back from dropping the girls off at the school bus. I keep teasing them that when there's snow on the ground, I'm not walking them to the bus anymore. They're on their own. But what I have realized this week as we have moved into fall, like the the equinox, the autumn equinox was a week ago today, I believe. Yeah, a week ago today. Today, as I'm recording this, it's the 29th and that was on the 22nd. The temperature's changed. It's getting darker earlier. I mean, it's dark before seven. Like I'm going out earlier and earlier to put the chickens, they're already in their hen house and lock them up and to lift up wing. So if you didn't know, Wing is one of our original Brahmas. She is a dark Brahma. And somehow, about four weeks ago, there was a big rainstorm. I came home late and she had an injured leg. She's still eating. She's still drinking. She's still socializing. But she has a hard time climbing up the steps to get into the hen house and refuses to climb down the steps. So, yeah, so she's been on a week of antibiotics. She's now on lots of vitamins and electrolytes and probiotics for chickens. She's on feed with extra protein. At one point, I brought her in the house for a while. She hates being by herself. So she's actually doing okay, but she needs a little extra assistance. Even though she's not an old lady, I feel like she's the old lady of the chickens. And she will stand there and ask for help in the morning and ask for help at night. And she loves to be held anymore. So it's it's made her a lot more docile. So that's the story of Wing. Uh, okay, so fall, right? And this episode is kind of about like biodynamic gardening and what do you do in the fall? So I'm going to share with you what I've been doing, what I've learned, and some of the important things that happen in fall to ensure that the soil is being enriched. Because part of biodynamic gardening is to create diversification of your soil, diversification of the landscape. Um, to have this dynamic mono, not mono, dynamic diversified culture in your yard or on your farm or in your garden, right? We don't want a monoculture. Monoculture is where everybody had green grass and hostas, <laughs> right? And and everything was lined up so perfectly and symmetrically. And it makes me think of like the 1970s and the 1980s and all of that like and, and people would hire, you know, ca- companies to come out and spray stuff on the lawns intentionally so they could keep their monoculture. And it was like this great thing of pride to have the perfect grass. And I was probably one of the first people in our subdivision that I'm aware of 12 years ago that said, screw the perfection. We're not spraying anything on our grass and welcome the dandelions. And a lot of our neighbors were like, oh. <gasps> They're letting all the dandelions grow. All those seeds are going to flow into my yard. Oh, my God. Why are these people here? And now – and I'm making all that up. My neighbors may not have said that. But in my head, that's what I was hearing. But now our neighbors are like, oh, my gosh, everything's so cool. Can I come see the chickens? Can I come see this? Do you have any of these plants? Do you have this? Uh, do you have any tomatoes you can, you can you know, sell us? Do you have cucumbers to sell us? It's, it's very interesting how – the stories I made up are so untrue. And our little homestead in Cook County, Illinois, right? We're in the same county as the city of Chicago, is just blooming and blossoming and becoming more and more diverse. And what do I mean by that? I mean that not only is our grass not a single kind of grass, our grass is a mixture of bluegrass and clover and dandelions and chokeweed, which I don't love chokeweed, but boy, those chickens love it. Some people call, uh, or it looks like morning glories when it blooms, but chokeweed is um, an invasive plant that I wish we didn't have, but we do have it. And like I said, the chickens and the rabbit love it, so let them have at it. We also have our potterage, which has some semi-structure to it. And what I'm doing right now with the fall is what I want to talk about. And we have our Hecate's garden, which is our herbals and medicinals and our berries. And then I have two raised beds that are considered for pollinators, right? To bring in more birds and more bees and more of those pollinating um, insects and beneficial wildlife. And so the pollinator gardens sit between me and a neighbor and it's kind of like the, the edging. And they have in them nettle and um, cat mint and cat nip and echinacea, uh, shasta daisies, cosmos, asters, snapdragons. Like they're just like for the girls, they could take 
scissors out there and pick fresh flowers every week if they wanted to for the whole season. Like they're still like in full bloom and they're beautiful. And again, when we talk about biodynamic gardening, there's a couple of things we have to talk about. No matter if it's in the potterage, the Hecate's garden, or in those pollinator beds, in the fall, we don't I don't trim anything back. I don't pull out dead stuff. I don't uh, take the weed eater and chop them all to the ground. I let them stay as they are through the frost, through when they look brown and dead, through the winter when the snow is up and on them. So we let all of that just stay there and kind of die and rot and fall down for many reasons, right? One is that a lot of those natural pollinators, a lot of the herbs in the Hecate's garden, and even some of the stuff in like dill and some of the other stuff in my potterage, self-seeds. So what does that mean? Self-seeding. It means that when they go to flower, radishes do this, lettuce does this, right? They go to flower, the flowers die and shrivel up and inside the flowers are seeds. And so if you let stuff go, the seeds will fall back down and in the spring they will sprout and come back again, right? Now some things are considered annuals, so they self-seed every year, and some things are considered biannuals, like the hollyhocks, and so they self-seed every other year. Like the seeds have to drop, the seeds have to go through like a really long, dormant, freezing time frame, and then they they reseed after the, the seeds get super cold, right? So those would be like biannuals. So first thing about biodynamic gardening is that I leave it all there. I leave it all there. My landscaper a lot of times is like, are you sure you don't want me to clean that up? I'm like, absolutely, don't clean that up. And so part of that is for self-seeding. The other part of that is that it will start to decay in the soil. And as the snow falls, it'll push some of it down on the soil. And so all of that decay creates more nutrients for the ground, more nutrients for our soil, more potassium, more nitrogen, more minerals and different things. It feeds the worms in the soil. Um, and so letting that, even the roots, right, just decay. So it creates lots of natural compost, right? A lot of us will go in the spring to, myself included, to like Home Depot or another garden store or to a greenhouse and buy bags and bags of compost or get a, a truck, right, with five yards of compost that you're then out there shoveling and moving on a wheelbarrow. Because you want those extra nutrients. And so a natural way to get those nutrients is to leave everything alone in the fall. It's starting to frost already. Like there was frost yesterday morning. There's a light frost this morning, which means over the weekend I got to go out and like finish harvesting a lot of stuff. And even this afternoon after I get done working, I need to go out and pick all the tomatoes that are slightly yellow, orange, or red before we get a hard frost next week. But so that's the second reason you want to just leave stuff, right? It's so it can decompose and it can naturally turn into compost and do that. The third reason is that it feeds the natural wildlife. It feeds the birds over the winter. It feeds little rabbits. It feeds some of that stuff that I personally, when there's a fresh snow, love to go see what kind of animal tracks are in our yard and see if we can identify them. I also love to like see a little rabbit scurry across the snow in an early morning on a fresh snow. And so by leaving a lot of that there, you're going to keep natural wildlife on your property. You're going to keep the little birds. You're going to, And you're also going to give them a place to shelter for the winter, depending on how much of your stuff is um, grown. So those are like the three reasons that I don't necessarily in the fall pull anything out. Now, if it is, there's an exception. If it is an invasive weed, if it is – and so for me, like an invasive weed is – cockerburs or ragweed because I'm allergic to ragweed. I will intentionally go and pull those out and you don't want to put those in your composter by any means because they'll just seed right in the compost and then you'll have them growing again and again. So if there are specific things that you do not want to come back, you could pull those out, right? But otherwise, don't go yanking stuff out of the ground just because it's frosted, just because it's dyed, just because it's turned crusty and browned. Uh, my girls like to say crusty, musty, and dusty. That's their new phrase. Crusty, musty, and dusty. Leave those there. Let them naturally decompose right where they're at. Let them self-seed, especially a lot of the flowers like the asters, the cosmos, the 
dra- uh, snapdragons, all of that self seeds. The echinacea is like a tubular, so it'll just and uh, your shasta daisies and all of that. So just leave that alone. The a lot of your um, your herbs will weather just fine, like the chamomile, the yarrow, um, the mint, the cat mint, the lemon balm, all of that. You just leave it alone in the spring, which we'll do a whole episode in the spring about biodynamic gardening. But in the spring, then you can say, okay, now I got to trim back the dead stuff, right? And for some of this, like the lemon balm and the yarrow and some of the mint, I don't even trim it back so much because it will green right up and it's gorgeous and beautiful. Okay, so what do you do when, like right now, my my basil is almost as tall as my shoulder, which is crazy to think that the basil got that tall. Let's talk about what you do with some of that stuff. Or like I have a thyme plant. You can't see it right now, but behind me in a container in the house. How do we save some of that knowing that there's a hard frost coming or there's snow in the forecast? Um whether it's plants that I've brought in, as you can see, there's a lot more green stuff here. Um, I will bring in the tropical plants. I bring in the succulents, the fig trees in the house. This is a palmaria plant from Florida. There's a palmaria somewhere else from California. There's different versions of palmaria. And um, I brought in geraniums. They're sitting on my floor. But when it comes to like some of those natural herbs that are in the ground, like the rosemary, the basil, the thyme, what you can do is you can take a clipping, so take the top of the plant, clip it off so it's about three, four inches long, take a few of the leaves off the bottom, so you're leaving about two-inch stem, stick it in a glass of water or a jar, and allow it allow it to root. Let it grow some roots, just like you would if you were starting another plant. It's, um, and then when it's got some roots, get yourself some indoor soil, so like house plant soil, so it's got nutrients in it, and replant those herbs so that you'll have fresh herbs for the winter inside, right? I'm going to do some of this in the greenhouse as well. I'm going to replant basil and things like that and put them in the greenhouse and see how we weather over the winter in the greenhouse. So those are some ideas that you can do for fall for biodynamic gardening. Now, the chickens are in my garden. If you've seen any videos or any pictures, they're running around like things. They're eating bugs. They're they're aerating the ground by poking holes in it and scratching the ground. And they're pooping everywhere. And they're molting right now. So my garden looks like a feather, feather heaven. It looks like somebody had a pillow fight in our garden. So what is that doing, right? In the idea of biodynamic gardening, chicken poop is considered a hot poop, which means it's, yes, high in nitrogen, but it will, because it's a hot poop, really, it could kill some plants that are not hardy because it's it's too hot, right? So by allowing the chickens out there right now in the fall, allowing them to poop and everything, when the snow gets on there and then the snow melts, it's going to break down the chicken poop and it's going to fertilize that soil. It's going to add natural nitrogen back to the soil. Same thing with the rabbit poop. Like our, we have a I think it's like 50-gallon Rubbermaid tub with no lid sitting underneath the rabbit hutch because as the rabbits play, it takes the broken down straw and hay, it catches the poop, and then I will take that as well. And you can make compost teas with it by taking rabbit poop and even chicken poop, putting them in a mason jar, adding some water to that, and allowing it to sit in the sunlight and then pouring that on your house plants, pouring that in your garden, putting that on maybe like your raspberry bushes or your currant bushes, and just naturally giving them a little bit of fertilizer. The other place that the rabbit poop will go is I will spread it over the strawberry plants, creating natural fertilizer, and that straw will create natural um protection for the strawberries over the the winter months. So those are some things that I'll be doing as well as we create more diversity in our soil and more of that um, diverse soil composition. There are other types of teas that people make for plants as well. Part of what we're doing in our first class and actually in every single class when we do the Little Witches Moon Gardening Club, which is if you've not heard, super excited about we start October 15th, so if you're in the Chicagoland area or the Milwaukee area, there is still time to sign up and have your kids come to our garden club. 
So the Little Witches Moon Gardening Club, and it's like little witches and little wizards, are coming to my homestead to learn about biodynamic gardening, learn about moon gardening, but also learn about Mother Nature and animals and all of this stuff that I talk about on the podcast, right? How to listen to their intuition when they're creative, how to just run around and have fun and not get in trouble, how um, they have a, they have time for music, like we're going to pull out the shamanic drums and let them play the drums. So I have a natural drum that was made with the goat skin. If you're vegan, I know you probably are not in love with that, but it is a beautiful drum. Um, they're going to have a chance to learn how to play crystal crystal singing bowls. We've got some other like cowbells and stuff where they're going to be able to just play in the music, learn, have a lesson every time we get together around gardening. Their first one is around herbal identification because the herbs are beautiful right now. So they're going to learn about herbal identification. If we have a lot of basil, they might even be able to do clippings this time and take basil home. Um then we're going to do monographs. So I'm going to start to teach them how to monograph herbs and create those scientific herbal pages. And then they're going to do what I'm calling witchcrafts, which is not witchcraft. It's actually garden crafts. And this month they are making a compost tea. And every single month they come to class and bring their mason jar. They're going to make a new compost tea. Why are we allowing the kids to make compost tea? It's a way to show gratitude and to give back to Mother Earth for all that she's given us. So they'll be able to take their compost tea home and use it for indoor house plants at their house or put it on an actual tree and say a little prayer for the tree and just thank the tree for being there for hundreds of years or, you know, tens of years. They could put it on, you know, different things. If they have their own garden, they could pour the tea in their garden and start to to diversify and feed the nutrients in the soil. And then we're going to do herbal infusions as well in October for our first garden club meeting. In November, we're going to learn about moon cycles and um, why there are certain times you want to plant when the moon is a certain position or not plant based on the magnetic pull of the moon, just like how the moon affects the ocean waves. It affects the soil and the ground and the roots and the water and the soil from that magnetic pole. So it is scientific, but it's also, you know, a little bit um, fun to learn. And that's why it's called Our Little Witches Moon School, because this is like old school gardening, things that you may have learned from the lady that lived on the edge of town, like the people that lived on the edge. Um, they traditionally might have been called a hedge witch. I like to call myself a green witch because green thumb, green plants, uh, herbalism, medicinals, fun stuff to do all with plants and gardening. And I love to just grow and watch it grow wild. Uh, So lots of fun stuff. And again, we have four classes scheduled for the fall and winter. So we've got October, November, December, and January. In January, the kids are going to start seed trays. So we'll have seed trays with 72 seed pods. They'll be actually starting their seed trays for gardening. And for those kids that don't have a spot to grow a garden at their own property, I will open up areas for allotments in our homestead so they can come and take care of their stuff, pick their own vegetables that they grow all season, and continue to be part of our club going into 2023. I'm so excited by this. Like, my girls are excited by this, and it's just like, we get to teach other people how to garden who maybe their parents didn't grow up gardening, but it's, it's amazing to be able to grow your own food, to learn how to care for Mother Earth, and just to have this wonderful I don't know. It's a creative experience for me to allow them to do it their way. There's no right and wrong when it comes to gardening. Like I said, it's not about having perfect lawns and no dandelions. It's about beautification and diversity and everything just kind of growing where it grows. Do you know you guys know this year that I had a cantaloupe grow where I didn't plant it. We have a squash grow where I didn't plant it. And a We had a sunflower plant come up right along the walking path where every time you had to go to the greenhouse, you had to like walk around the sunflower and step off the walking path because the birds or the squirrels decided that that's where these things needed to grow. That sunflower plant produced probably 25 sunflowers on one stem, which is so unique. Normally you get a stem with one sunflower or a stem with two sunflowers. It was huge. Uh... The cantaloupe, we picked three cantaloupes from a plant that we didn't even plant. And then the squash plant, I will say that the squirrels got the squash, but uh, it grew right next to the driveway. It was crazy. And I just let that stuff go because that's part of diversification and allowing things to grow where Mother Nature wants them to grow. 
So lots and lots of fun stuff. I will leave you with one thing. If your association requires that you like trim stuff down, cut the heads off of everything that you would like to have seeds for or would like to grow back next year, put those in a brown paper bag, bring them inside, and next spring after the snow melts, spread, like crush up those flower heads that have dried and spread those seeds back out. And that's one way you can self-seed or even share, (coughs) excuse me, share seeds with a friend or neighbor. So thank you for joining us today on Cultivating. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Share with me what your favorite part was. Share with me when what you learned about biodynamic gardening. What is something that today you're going to put into practice in your own yard? Like share with me in an email at tiffany at cultivatingguts.com or even over at Instagram at I am Tiffany Hinton or at I am Cultivating Guts. Ask us any questions. Feel free to private message us. I'm here for you and I'm excited to see all your benefits. Satnam, love you guys. So if you love this episode, remember to share it with your friends and anyone who could benefit from learning more about biodynamic gardening and what to do in the fall and winter season. To get our newest book, our Green Witch Garden Ultimate Garden Planner, you can visit Amazon or check out our website, www.cultivatingguts.com. And I want to let you guys know our very next live event is for children and families and you pay for your child to come and you as the adult can stay or drop them totally your preference, but it is our brand new Little Witch Moon Gardening Club that we are starting. We've got four dates on the calendar for fall and winter to get these kids learning about biodynamic gardening, learning about gardening with the moon cycles and herbs and medicinals, herbal properties, and so much creative fun for them. There is no right or wrong to gardening and the kids will be able to feel into their intuition. We're looking for intuitive children that want to be in mother nature. Come December, we might say put on your snowsuits and come to class. This is totally a nature school. It is an outdoor program hosted on my own homestead. They have a chance to interact with not only the chickens, but also our baby rabbits. They will have a chance to grow their own stuff, start their own seeds in January, and create some amazing, amazing different herbal crafts and create their own reference guide and learn about gardening from a young age like I did myself so that it becomes kind of like just ingrained in their soul, a part of them, and it doesn't take a lot of thought as they get older. Um, My mission is to raise children that are in tune with nature that help heal Mother Earth as adults. And I know we can do this together. So if you want to learn more about our Little Witches Moon Gardening School, I encourage you to visit www.cultivatingguts.com. We have a bundle right now that's out there. They can You can sign up for all four classes. You end up saving over $80. Otherwise, each class is $50. That includes their supplies. They're getting $40 in supplies every month from their little their backpacks, their field journals. They get monograph pages. We're using homeschooling material from two of my favorite homeschoolers in the program. They get, um, like in October, we're doing uh, almond oil infusions for skin And we're doing olive oil infusions that they're going to learn how to make with organic herbs, right, that they get to pick and choose for using in the kitchen throughout the winter and so many more other things. And they're going to learn about natural composting teas that are part of biodynamic gardening from the start that came, you know, from when it was created. And so, so much more stuff is so exciting. Uh, So for that, um, for the children, like I said, you are welcome to stay as their parent. And if you have siblings, we do have some programs there. You can send me an email if you're a family. But visit www.cultivatingguts.com for more information and to sign up. We start October 15th right here in northern Chicago, um, Chicago land. So we're about 30 minutes from Wisconsin and about 30, 40 minutes from the city of Chicago. So definitely drive over if you're able to for that live event on October 15th. And pre-register so I've got the supplies ready to go for your kids. And with that, guys, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to message me at tiffany at cultivatingguts.com. And I... We'll have everything you need. And if it's not there, again, send us a message at www.cultivatingguts.com for you to get started with our gardening masterclass and to get growing and growing your own food to help yourself and your family.